the opportunity to get together each week to discuss your word. Please send your Holy Spirit upon us this morning and help us to uh, be open to what your Spirit may speak to us in and through our discussion and help us as we move into the future to be open to where you are calling and leading and inviting us and to follow with generous hearts. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, a couple of weeks ago, or earlier this summer, this month, I asked if, if people had questions or topics that we could cover in this last week, because we are now finished in terms of our Sunday readings, we are finished with the Bread of Life discourse. Uh, we're done with that part of John's Gospel. So when you go to church this weekend, you're going to hear a story from Mark's Gospel. We're back into Mark, and we'll be there till the end of the liturgical year. Okay? So three people came up and asked me questions. And, uh, oh dear, <laughs> and I will try to answer them the best way I can. And if we have time, I have another topic. Um, so, the first question is probably the hardest one. Somebody came up to me and, and asked me, what about the vengeful God? Um, and that, that's a very hard one for, for me to address because I think it would take a lot of study, which I, I didn't have time for. Um, but I looked up something on vengeance and vengeful God, and what I found briefly was that avenging had to do with family. And it had to do with the father being vengeful if anyone in his family was threatened. So the father would protect his wife and children. So transfer that to God. God was always protecting Israel. Okay? And so if God was vengeful toward their enemies, it was to protect his people. Now this is really putting it in a very short form. Um, and we know when we read the Bible and you read the Old Testament, they will talk about enemy tribes and, and so on, and you have 10,000 people being killed, or 20,000. You know, does God really want that? That's where it gets difficult to talk about. So I think I would rather not go there. Um, but just keep in mind that avenging was uh, for the leader of the family to protect the rest of the family. More often, and, you know, and I think, I think, uh, I hope I'm saying it right. This is a very general thing. Sometimes do we project onto God our human feelings or understandings. So if, um, if the Packers would have won last night, we would have said God is on our side, right? And how often we want God to be on the side of our team. You know, is God really on the side of one sports team or another? You know, God's on everybody's side, I think, when it comes to that. When we project onto God, if we feel mean and angry towards someone and we want to get even, we project that onto God. God's going to get even with that. I'm not sure about that. But that's a very deep topic, and I don't want to go any further. Except to say, look at the Old Testament, and it talks about God, you know, doing all this stuff for tens of thousands of people, and God, you know, brought about 20,000 dying in Israel, one, and, and that kind of thing. How often does the Old Testament teach about a compassionate God? And there are some very, very 
beautiful things in the Old Testament. Psalm 103, for example, says, As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. Isaiah 54, when you go into, a, there's several, lots of places in the prophets, but Isaiah 54, you know, um, for a moment I turn myself away from you, but with great tenderness I will take you back. You know, though the mountains may fall and the hills turn to dust, that's Isaiah 54. Um, my love shall never leave you, nor my covenant of peace does be destroyed, says the Lord who has pity on you. So much more than a vengeful God is this God who is a lover. And I think we need to uh, focus on that. Any comment or question? I have one. Oh, dear. <laughs> I didn't want you to have one. It'll be good. It'll be good. Okay. I'd rather not talk about a vengeful God. I've been in a recovery group for 20 years, and all the Catholics that come in the recovery groups that I've been in taught me or told me that they were always brought up about the vengeful God, not the loving God, the forgiving God. And we had to work really hard with a lot of the people that came into our group to get them to know that there is a loving God. A lot of them come in no longer believing in God. So we had to undo a lot of Catholic teaching, to be honest with you. Exactly. And I work with recovery groups at the retreat house. Um, Yes, how many people have said, I was brought up with a judgmental, vengeful God, and um, now that I'm an adult, I can't trust that God. Or I remember in the Baltimore Catechism, the, the question was, is God just? And the answer was, yes, God is just. He rewards the good and punishes the wicked. And somehow they put more emphasis on the second part of that. You know, be good or God will punish you, right? So if you got sick, what did you do wrong? God is punishing you. And I think, yes, we have to undo a lot of that Catholic teaching. I mean, not a lot of teaching, but a lot of emphasis on that particular thing, that God punishes you. Um, I think a lot of times when we say God punished us, if we punished ourselves, we got ourselves into the mess we're in. But, yeah. If you look at it a different way from when God says, vengeance is mine, says the mm -hmm. Lord, um, it's like him as a father saying, you don't have to worry about this, right. you don't have to be vengeful, I'll deal right. with it. Not, yeah. I'm going to whip anybody <laughs> or anything, but I'll just take care of that. You can go ahead. God will take care of it. We don't have to worry about being vengeful. Good, thank you. Okay. Is that enough on that topic? I don't want to talk anymore. <laughs> She's honest. She's always telling me what to do. All right, another question that came up. Somebody said to me, could you say something more about the word lamb? Okay. So, what can we say about lamb? The lamb was a very important animal in the Middle East. And when people had flocks, it was using flocks of sheep. And, and why? As I understand it, the, the sheep's mouth is formed in such a way that it can bite close to the ground. And in the Middle East, you know, where, which is semi-arid in many places, um, there isn't a whole lot of tall grass. So that the sheep's mouth was, was formed so that it could bite close to the ground. And I believe the hooves were formed in such a way that they could climb rocky places. So you have thousands and thousands of, of the, the lambs and the sheep out there in the Middle East. Um, the lamb in the Old Testament was most frequently mentioned as a sacrificial victim. The flesh of the lamb was a delicacy to eat, okay? 
The lamb was a figure of innocence and helplessness. So when we come to the story of the Exodus, um, we know that the tenth plague, the tenth punishment for the Egyptians was the death of the firstborn. And what was Moses told to do? Get a lamb, kill it, collect the blood. Have the Israelites paint the blood on the doorposts of their houses so that the angel of death, when the angel of death comes through the country, the angel will pass over the houses of the Egyptians. Okay? Um, that's where we get the word Passover from. Yes? Passover, the homes of the Egyptians? I'm sorry, <laughs> Israelites. I'm sorry, it's early in the morning. <laughs> no, not the Egyptians. <laughs> not ever the Egyptians. It was always the Israelites. <clears throat> Please don't tell Father Tom. <laughs> <laughs> and so then we turn to Jesus, and Jesus is called the Lamb of God. Why? He was totally innocent. And at, at the time of the crucifixion, he was totally helpless. You know, they had him in their hands, and they did what they wanted to do. Um, and so he is called the Lamb of God because his blood was spilled on the wood of the cross. And his blood, his death, saved us. So he is the Lamb of God. Now there was a word, a Greek word, um, that had two meanings. And that Greek word could mean Passover lamb, or it could mean servant of God. So that it is possible that when John the Baptist was preaching by the Jordan River, and said, there is the Lamb of God, it's possible he might have meant there is the servant of God. And, and what's the significance of that? You go back to the prophet Isaiah, and he has in, starting with chapter 42, four suffering servant songs. In the prophet Isaiah, there are four suffering servant songs in which he describes how the servant of God will live and what the servant of God will do. The last part is chapter 53, which is what we hear on Good Friday. It's the first reading on Good Friday, and, the, and, and it's from Isaiah, but you know, the details of the crucifixion are there. He was pierced for our sins, and it mentions he was led like a sheep to the slaughter. He opened not his mouth. Um, he was given a burial place, you know, among the, among strangers. He was, um, you know, the different details of the sufferings of Jesus are in that fourth suffering servant song that we hear um, on Good Friday. But um, we can transfer that to Jesus. So when John says, there is the servant of God, if the people are familiar with Isaiah, then they know that this is the one who is fulfilling those four prophecies about what the suffering servant will be like. Um, also in the first letter of Peter, Peter talks about Jesus in that same context. Uh, Peter talks about realize that you were ransomed from your feudal conduct handed on by your ancestors, not with perishable things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a spotless, unblemished lamb. So he's comparing Jesus to the unblemished lambs that were offered at the temple as sacrifice. Um, And then we go to the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, which is a, a, a beautiful book, has, has tremendous meaning, 
but you have to understand all the symbolism in it. The last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, mentions Jesus as with the title of Lamb 28 times. And Jesus is the sacrificial Lamb. He saved us by his blood. He was enthroned and glorified. He was victorious in war. He was a judge who has the book of life. But the theme of sacrificial death and triumph are joined together in such a way that the basis of his glorification is his redemptive death. So the whole Paschal mystery is brought out. But it's used 28 times. If you want to read a wonderful book, there is a book called The Lamb's Supper, written by Scott Hahn. And he takes the, the, Jesus as the Lamb of God in terms of the book of Revelation and connects it to the Eucharist. The Lamb's Supper. It's an excellent book. Not the Last Supper, but the Lamb's Supper. Lamb. The Lamb's Supper, I'm sorry. It is early in the morning. Okay, yes, the Lamb's Supper. Any question or comment? Yes. Well, often you hear uh, the question, why does God need a lamb to suffer? Why does he need a sacrificial offering? Oh. That's <laughs> another whole class. Why does God need a sacrificial offering? You know, if you look at the history of the world, I think, uh, right straight through the cultures, the, the idea was you give God something. You give God something. Um, and, I, and I guess the more it hurts, the, the greater the sacrifice, I'm not sure. Uh, but people sacrifice people in some cultures. Uh, people have sacrificed, given up. I think the idea is you take what you love the most, you take what is best, and, and you give it to God because God deserves the best. And so I know in some cultures they would sacrifice children and they would have a contest in the town or the village. And who was the most beautiful girl? They would have a contest. My soul is not on the sea. My soul is good. They would have a contest and um, Boy, if your daughter was chosen, you have, you were so proud your daughter was the most beautiful girl in the, you know in this town. And then your heart was broken because she was going to be sacrificed to the God. The idea was you take the best. Okay? That is why you hear that term first fruits of the harvest. They offered their first fruits. Why? The first represented everything else that was to come. But you gave the first. That's why that firstborn son was so important. You gave the first to God. God got the best. What do we do at Mass? What do we do at Mass? What's the matter? You Giggling and answering. <laughs> what do we do? What do we do at mass? I would ask students. You know, we come to mass to give God something, and I would say to them, "What's the only thing that's good enough for God?" And they go around and around and around. Well, our love, well, our love is sometimes weak, often weak. Well, our faith, our faith is weak. What do we give to God? Finally, they come to the conclusion the only thing that's good enough for God is the collection basket. God, <laughs> not the collection basket. <laughs> God, the only thing that's good enough for God is God. But sister, just going back to what you, what I just teased you with, that money that was given or that offering was probably the only thing those people at that time had to give right. in a sense of honesty to that God they worship. Right. The only thing that's good enough for God is God. Is that what we do at Mass? Every day. 
We come to church to say thank you to God for all God's blessings of the week, and we give God to God. You had better listen to the Eucharistic prayer. Because after he consecrates the bread and wine, the bread and wine are now the body and blood of Jesus, what does the priest say? Mindful of his passion, death, resurrection, ascension, looking forward to his coming in glory, we offer you the bread of life and the cup of eternal salvation. The only thing that's good enough for God is God. Jesus is God. We offer you the bread of life and the cup of eternal salvation. So we give God the best we can give to God by offering him the body and blood of Jesus. You can't do that at home. Okay, I don't care how beautiful the woods is or how beautiful it is to sit by your dock by the lake and uh, read the scriptures on Sunday morning. We offer God to God. There was even an amen that we sang. Amen, amen. We offer God to God again. Amen. We used to sing that at children's liturgies. Do we really hear what we're saying? And then we go to God through him, with him, in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, we go to God, giving God all honor and glory. That's what we do at Mass, and that's what most Catholics don't know. Sister, in, uh, just to get back on that, uh, uh, that uh, firstborn, in our family, it was the fourthborn that was the best. Oh, is that right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying. Why was it the first boy? <laughs> okay, well, when you go the next time you go to Mass, please listen to the Eucharistic prayer. We offer God, we offer Jesus, the Lamb of God, to God the Father. And then we go to God the Father, not by ourselves, because we are weak and sinful, we go to God through Jesus, with him, and in him, and within the unity of the Holy Spirit, we give all glory and honor to God. That's a profound thing that we do at Mass. And most Catholics don't know that. But in the olden days, we always used the term, the holy sacrifice of the Mass. That's why. That's why. Okay. Yes. I was going to mention in the chapel, the divine mercy, it says we offer the body and blood of the Lord Jesus Christ for two and four sins and all sins. You're actually doing it in your prayer. Right. You know? Right. Okay. The, uh, the Cairo research firm says that 30% of the Catholics that go to church don't believe that's the body and blood of Christ. 30%? Yeah. I heard 70%. Yeah, that's what he said. Yeah, I thought it was like 30. You're right. I'm sorry. I had a little cut. Yeah, 70%. 40, 30% believe that that's the body. 30% do believe it's the body and blood of Jesus because we don't think. We just got to keep teaching. Right. Okay. Oh, my. Yes. I just had one comment with the question that was asked about why God needed the lamb. And we can go all the way back to the Garden of Eden where we see that um, they sinned and that that was death. And now that because they sinned and we have death, we're all sinners because we're all born after their likeness. We're all born in Adam. And Jesus, who is perfect, and like you said, God can only accept perfect because he is just. Right. And yes. Jesus had to come and sacrifice himself and lay down his life so that he could come right. into Right. None of us could have died to save the world. None of us. It had to be someone without sin. Okay. Question? Well, I don't know because I always receive the body.
by the end of life. Um, I think I addressed that a couple of weeks ago. Why the body, why when we go to communion, do we receive the body and the blood of Jesus? Right, but if you receive only the body or only the blood, you are receiving uh, the whole person of Jesus. Then why are they offerable? Because that was part, that the way it was done at the Passover meal and the Last Supper, and I can't I can't find it here. Um, Okay, the common human expression for human life for the entire person was flesh and blood. So it's coming out of the, the Hebrew concept of the whole person is represented by blood, I mean by uh, wine and flesh and blood. Flesh and blood. However, if we receive only the only drink from the cup or only receive the sacred bread, it is, we are receiving the whole person of Christ. Okay. All right. Let's go to the third question. Um, the third question was, uh, somebody came up to me and said, you have been talking um, off and on about this whole journey from slavery to freedom. Is there somewhere in the Bible, is there a blueprint for our lives? Um, I'm not sure exactly what the person meant, but I have a lot to say about it. Um, is there a blueprint for our lives? Well, I think that's why that book of Exodus is so important. Because the blueprint of our lives, in a way, is that journey of the Israelites from Egypt to the Promised Land. And so I put these four words on the board. Um, you start; They started with slavery. They were led through the Red Sea to freedom. But as soon as they had their freedom, they found themselves in the desert. And the desert led them to Mount Sinai, where they entered into covenant relationship. And then after that, they will eventually end up in the promised land. But I think our the blueprint for our lives, and I, I, I think I put these in two different um, lines because I think they're, they're two different movements, and yet they're the same. Um, we constantly are moving from slavery to freedom. And there's no, there may be a blueprint in the Bible, but there's no timeline. The timeline recycles itself. So uh, a person can be, I think, think of immigrants and refugees, I and mean, think of people subjected to gun violence, that's slavery. Okay, and we hope these people get to freedom. But I think on any given day, we are making the journey from slavery to freedom. It can be in big ways. I think a person who lost their job, unemployed, they're in slavery. They find a job, they're moving into freedom. A person who's been in a very difficult relationship, okay, slavery, they get the help they need to move within that relationship or out of it, they're moving to freedom. Person who's been sick 
Helen, I was hobbling around on crutches because I refused to think there was something wrong with my knee. I was in slavery, had the surgery, freedom. Sometimes the weather can become, we make us slaves, you know, we feel like slaves. The storm comes and we're in freedom unless we're flooded. <laughs> But on any given day, you know, getting up at 5 o'clock this morning, it's like, do I have to? And, and then I think of what Pedro Arupi said, it is love that makes you get up in the morning. Yes, okay, I will get up. Um, slavery, I gotta get up early this morning. Freedom, I'm doing what I love to do the best, um, besides pray, which is teach. So on any given day, we are moving from slavery to freedom. And sometimes it takes a while before a person realizes, you know, I am enslaved by this situation. And people recovering from addictions, slavery to freedom, big time. It might take a while a person has a job and they don't realize how they feel like a victim and all of a sudden they say, I'm in slavery, I gotta get out of here. Okay? I also think that we go from desert to covenant a lot in our lives. And a desert experience often can be a retreat experience. Jesus went into the desert at the beginning of his public life to do what? To discern the temptations that would come to him, not only in the desert, but out in his public life. They play out. And he had to know what he was getting into. People make a retreat before they get married, before they're ordained to the priesthood, before they make religious vows. People make a retreat. Why? To stop and think about what's coming and what are going to be the trials and the temptations. And I, I'm willing to take this new commitment on. And then they move into the commitment. And I think um, those are big time things. But there are times when uh, we make these small commitments. Um, we might be having a hard time or, and we're, we feel like there's no answer. And you know, I, I feel you know bored with life or whatever. That's my desert. And then I recommit to go on. That's my covenant. I think I was as I was thinking about this, I couldn't help but think of all that's going on in the news today. Very sad about the sexual abuse in the church. And if you look at a person who's been victimized. Uh, by an abuser. I, I think they go through the same thing. Uh, a person who's been abused, and, and it can be sexual, it can be physical, verbal, whatever, is certainly in slavery. They are a victim of the perpetrator, okay? And then comes the day when they start talking about it. And they admit to somebody that this happened to them. And then they may be led to some counseling. That's talking about opening up the door, revealing what happened is the movement from slavery to freedom. But then as time goes on, People struggling with abuse, especially sexual abuse, will be in the desert much of their lives um, thinking, I'm dirty, I'm bad, I'm no good. Uh, if I was good, nobody would have done this to me. It was my fault, I'm guilty. And, and they're dealing with that whole issue of shame. And then they may come to, with the help that they can get, they will come to the conviction someday, I'm a good person. And the covenant is, I accept myself. And I accept that I am a child of God, that I am good and worthwhile, and God has always loved me, never turned away from me. 
So we, I think we go through this pattern over and over and over in our lives, you know? Um, and we say, you know, maybe people in marriage go through this. It's like, are we getting bored with each other? I've not been married, I can't, I'm just guessing, okay? <laughs> are we getting bored with each other? Are we not helping each other enough? And are, you know, all of a sudden the kids are gone, they're grown up, and we're the empty nesters, now what? Now what do we do with the rest of our lives? That's a desert experience. And what do we do? We recommit. And it might just be through a hug or a kiss. We recommit to being with each other. Okay? Um, it happens over and over in our lives. Okay. Let's just take two minutes, three minutes, and take a little break. And if you have any, I have something else, and you're going to need your Bibles for the next piece. Verse 13. 
This is an Easter story. And I presume you are quite familiar with it. This is the question. I'm going to read the story. The question is, if I gave you a piece of paper, blank piece of paper, and saw and told you, draw four boxes, and what you are going to do is make a comic strip with four pictures that summarize the whole story. Okay? So pretend. Pretend that you have a blank piece of paper, you've got four boxes on it, and, that, and you're going to put in, make a comic strip that of four pictures that tells this whole story. Okay, here we go. Now that very day, two of them were going to a village seven miles from Jerusalem called Emmaus. And they were conversing about all the things that had occurred. And it happened that while they were conversing and debating, Jesus himself drew near and walked with them, but their eyes were prevented from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you doing? What are you discussing as you walk along? They stopped looking downcast. One of them named Cleophas said to him in reply, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know of the things that have taken place there in these days? And he replied to them, What sort of things? They said to him, The things that happened to Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word, before God and all the people. How our chief priests and rulers both handed him over to a sentence of death and crucified him. But we were hoping that he would be the one to redeem Israel. And besides all this, it is now the third day since this took place. Some women from our group, however, have astounded us. They were at the tomb early in the morning and did not find his body. They came back and reported that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who announced that he was alive. Then some of those with us went to the tomb and found things just as the women had described, but him they did not see. And he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are! How slow of heart to believe all that the prophets spoke! Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them what had referred to him in all the scriptures. As they approached the village to which they were going, he gave the impression that he was going on farther. But they urged him, saying, Stay with us, for it is nearly evening, and the day is almost over. So he went in to, to stay with them. And it happened, while he was at table with them, he took bread, said the blessing, broke it, and gave it to them. With that, their eyes were opened, and they recognized him but he vanished from their sight. Then they said to each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he spoke to us on the way and opened the scriptures to us? So they set out at once and returned to Jerusalem where they found, gathered together the eleven and those with them who were saying, The Lord has truly been raised and has appeared to us, and has appeared to Simon. Then the two recounted what had taken place on the way and how he was made known to them in the breaking of the bread. Okay, you got four pictures. 
Take a moment at your table. What would those four pictures be? And here you have 
the meal, the liturgy of the Eucharist. And then we go to Jerusalem. What's that? The dismissal rite. Now that you've experienced Jesus, you're not going to keep it to yourself. Evangelization, right. Okay, so in that story of Luke, that Easter story, it is the outline of the Mass. And so when we come to Mass every week, we come as we are with our own story of dying and rising, slavery and freedom. In the liturgy of the Word, somehow, what it, it's about dying and rising. It's a good question to ask yourself every Sunday. What did this say to me about dying and rising? But Jesus talked to them about dying and rising. He explained the scriptures. He went through Moses and the prophets. That's Old Testament 101. He gave them a whole course. But was it not ordained, was it not ordained that the Messiah should suffer and so enter into his glory? That's dying and rising. He's explaining the pastoral mystery. The liturgy of the Eucharist. He, it, and it's the uh, liturgical formula. He took the bread, blessed it, broke it, gave it. That's the liturgical rite. And why does Jesus vanish from their sight? Why does he disappear? Because he's there. And once he's there in the Eucharist, you don't need the flesh and blood physical body. He's there. He never disappeared. He vanished from sight. Okay? He stayed with them in the Eucharist. And when they go back running to Jerusalem, what's their main thing that they say? We have seen the Lord. He's risen. You always start the story at the end of the story. They didn't run back saying Jesus was born in Bethlehem. They ran back saying Jesus is risen. And we met him. That is the outline of the Mass. And I was, and the final thought is I was thinking about, we're concluding the Bread of Life discourse. Think about it. It was given in the synagogue in Capernaum. It follows the same pattern. The people are coming together with an experience they had the day before, the multiplication of the loaves. Okay? And Jesus is kind of chiding them, saying, you know, don't work for the bread that perishes. But they're coming together because they have hopes for a Messiah because they were fed yesterday. That's the condition in the synagogue. Jesus goes on with that big word, the sapiential theme. You must believe in the Son of God. You know, I am the bread of life and I come from the Father. If you believe in me, he's presenting himself, explaining who he is, inviting people to believe. That's the liturgy of the word, the sapiential theme. Then he goes on in verse 51 to talk about my flesh is real food and my blood is real drink. That's, that's the sacramental theme. We're at the meal part. And then finally last week, well, are you going to stay with me or not? And Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. They are going to follow him wherever he goes. So in that Eucharistic discourse, you also have the pattern of the Mass. We come together. The scriptures are explained. The meal we follow him. Okay, so um, I hope this has helped you to uh, come to a better appreciation of the Mass. It's been delightful.